Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name, name is Danica Joan with my co-host, Bob Bud Vino. This is going to an amazing show, an amazing show because we have an amazing guest, Dr. Robert Evans. Bud, take it away. Yes, Danica. Danica is a little tongue-tied because she's so excited. I can tell you before we start recording, we're both very excited. There's energy. It's palpable. It's tangible, Danica. We're here. Custody Matters Live brought to you by the Dad Talk Today Network. Wednesday, February 19th, 2020, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before we get going, Danica, I want to give a shout-out to my wife and say happy birthday. It's her birthday today, the 19th, and thank her parents because they uh, gave birth to a great legend, my wife. So happy birthday to my wife. Custody Matters Live. Here we go, Danica. I'm going to let you do the intro. Here we go again, to paraphrase Whitesnake. Uh, 1987, I'm dating myself. It's going to be an amazing show, Danica. It's going to be a helpful show. I'm excited as I know you are, my friend. Yes, yes. So Dr. Evans is a parental alienation expert, but he also happens to be a licensed school psychologist. So he gets it from a lot of different perspectives. He, um, and so I'm going to go ahead and let you say something, Dr. Re uh, Evans. Welcome to the show. Say something. Uh, well, thank, something. You, thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> I guess if you'd like me to talk a little bit about my background, and I, I am licensed in the state of Florida as a school psychologist. I was licensed in, in other states in, in Virginia years ago as a professional counselor. And um, so I, I'm kind of a different kind of a school psychologist in the sense that uh, I don't work for a school system any longer. I'm strictly in private practice. And my practice is very focused on uh, forensic psychology, which means uh, basically the marriage of mental health and the law. And so I do a lot of expert witness testimony. I do child custody evaluations. I have extensive training in doing those evaluations, um, juvenile justice types of evaluations. So it's, it's sort of an unusual practice in the sense that um, I don't just simply do, you know, learning disability evaluations and that type of thing that you would expect a typical school psychologist to do. So it's a little different. So how did you get into like parental alienation needs needed? It seemed like that's like a, the niche that that you went down. Uh, did it have something to do with you being a school psychologist? Well, um, once upon a time, I was licensed, I, I licensed in the state of Florida in 1987. And so I had a clinical practice where I was meeting children and families and I was doing a typical school psychology practice, testing kids for schools and that type of thing. I would run groups, uh, self-esteem groups for kids, that type of thing. Um, and I would do family counseling. And so somewhere around the early 1990s, I, I kind of marked the point of 1993, I had some cases that actually drugged me into the courtroom. And I thought, wow, this is an interesting environment. I better learn how to do this if this is going to happen. And so I did. I took a lot of, uh, you know, workshops, postgraduate kinds of programs to learn how to, how to do what I do in terms of child custody, parent coordination, family and divorce, uh, mediation, that type of thing. I've also trained in collaborative law practice. And so I found myself in court. And one of the earliest cases was uh, an alienation case. And um, I had to figure out what that was about. And so I actually contacted Richard Gardner in New York, in New Jersey, and um, actually consulted with him on a couple of cases. And so I just kept reading and learning about parent alienation and um, as you probably know, Dr. Bone and I co-authored a book on the topic. And, and then I started doing some education for attorneys um, on the topic because it was, it's still the case that many, many attorneys, judges, um, you name it, guardian ad litems, counselors and therapists don't know a lot about parent alienation. And it's not like this was a brand new topic that just popped up. This is going on now since what Gardner wrote about it in the uh, mid 18, 1980s. And so here we are. And so that's what happened was I, I, I had to learn about parent alienation and I had to, I saw what it's doing to children. I saw what it's doing to, to parents, but you know, so the courts supposedly have this, um, you, know, you know, what's in the children's best interest concept, which 
I, we could argue about whether that's really happening in the courtrooms. Um, and so that's what happened. And here I am. And I've been doing this now since, like I said, 1993, um, with hundreds of cases under my belt. You know, one of the reasons that I'm so committed to us doing at, uh, conferences to educate the professionals was because it touched me personally. I was really shocked and amazed that these licensed mental health counselors, these legal professionals, these I mean, like all across the board, they really didn't know some of the simplest things that, of course, I you know, when you're affected by it, you become like a pseudo expert at all of it. So one of the things that I discovered was children will protect their abusers. And you can see it in the foster system, how a child is being abused and neglected. Next thing you know, all they want is to be with that, that parent. And um, in a custody battle situation, if they're throwing one parent completely under the bus and the other one is completely um, like angelic, there's something smells here. So why is it that the professionals can't, haven't figured that out? It's an interesting question because what we're finding out is there's almost like there's a counter movement against parental alienation by a section, a segment of a large segment of the mental health professionals. And I can't explain it. Uh, they seem to be absolutely hell bent on trying to advertise that there's no such thing. This is pseudoscience. The very point you just mentioned, there's a research out of the uh, HHS and Center for Disease Control that basically validates the idea that children who are abused actually tend to uh, become protectors, if you will, of the abusers, the perpetrators. And now there's, a, a, there's research out to say, oh, that's not true. That's, that's, that's baloney. And people who are advocating that really don't know anything about that. We've got a, we have some sort of, I don't want to get into a negative mode here, but you know, this APSAC, the American society, American uh, uh, professional society on child abuse, just put not too long ago, put out a position paper of like, well, you know, we're not really supporting, or we don't really, our research doesn't really support the whole concept of parent alienation. And it's like, wait a second, if you read their professional guidelines and the behaviors that uh, alienating parents do to children, favorite parents, if you will, it's child abuse. I mean, it, it doesn't like a rocket scientist, you know? If you've got a parent that's throwing another parent under the bus, alleging that they've been sexually abused or physically abused, and well, this happened before the child obviously could remember. I had one child tell me that um, uh, when his mother was pregnant, his, uh, the father pushed her down the stairs. Now, hello, how did he, if that even happened, how did he know about that? Because somebody had to tell him, hello. Now, is that healthy? My, my position on parents will say to me, well, what should I tell my child? You know, I want my child to tell the truth. My question, my answer to that always is, tell me what the child's going to benefit from the answer information and then you can decide if that's going to be useful for the kid okay if there's no benefit to a child i don't know if you parent may have been a have been involved with substance abuse when they were in college that's very common okay well, of course today it's legal all over the place but back then it was illegal and it's a bad thing to do those parents get labeled as drug addicts Okay, well, what's the benefit to the child to know that, even if it was true? Okay, and so it's like there is no benefit, there's no payoff because what you're doing is setting the child up for a rejection for that parent because they're a substance abuser. Well, I, I it was interesting. I just had a case not too long ago in, in uh, over in Orlando, and dad came from California. California, of course, marijuana is legal, not only that. This guy had a medical license, if you will. He had a prescription for medical marijuana. And I tell you, from the time he left California, the court records just showed how much of a drug abuser he was. He went through years of, 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 of treatment and testing. Every couple of months, he had to get tested. He, it never came up with anything, but he just get, and got to Florida, and they just mm -hmm. kept beating that drum. And... Uh, the good news was that we had a good judge who kind of said, you know what, I think it's time to stop this. And he did, thank goodness. 
So. Wow, that's amazing. I, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the ACEs study, because mm. we've talked about it off the air. Um, tell people, tell our viewers, what is the ACEs study and how does it impact children into adulthood? Well, uh, you know, that's, we could spend a few hours on this topic. Uh, ACEs is Adverse Childhood Experiences, it was study that was reported in the uh, 19, 1998 Journal of Preventive Medicine. And researchers got together with one of the insurance companies out in California that worked out of a clinic in San Diego. And they solicited over 13,000 people to respond to a questionnaire for various reasons. The questionnaires got whittled down to over 9,000. I'm trying to think 9,300 people that responded and in those questionnaires, they ask people like, well, you know, were we ever slapped as a child? Were your parents ever divorced? Did one parent ever, you know, say something negative about the other parent? Or did they ever put you down? Did they, uh, uh, did they you know, were they derogatory towards the child? And there was, a, there was 10 items that they looked at. Um, it turned out that almost all of the 93,000 people, 93,000 people had at least one adverse childhood experience and then have percentages going up to how many had six and seven and whatever. Well, when they got done they started looking at the correlations with physical ailments, because this was a medical study, um, they looked at the correlations between the responses, how many adverse childhood experiences a child would have or a person, these are adults, so they remembered back in, in terms of what happened to them as a child, five or six adverse childhood experiences started to correlate with things as severe as a loss of 20 years of life. So there was a cohort group that didn't have these experiences. They lived to the age of 85. The group that had these extensive childhood uh, experiences uh, lived to the age of seven, 65. So it was like a 20 year difference. Then after that, you get into who had coronary heart disease, who had immune deficiencies, who had various medical problems. But you look at today's society and watch television, okay? Because what you're going to see is who's advertising for Medicare and who's advertising for Medicaid, and how many physical ailments Americans have, adults, senior adults. Um, if this is a study of 9,300 people out of out of san diego california with one clinic i mean that's what blows my mind is we're talking about one corner of i mean a, a, a dot on the map if we multiply that times all of the kinds of all of the people in the united states the numbers are going to be staggering okay well so you go from the correlational study of the ACEs where you have X number of adverse childhood experiences to what correlates with various diseases that we have in terms of even a life threatening aspect. So you look at the effects of toxic stress and what happens is now you're getting into causation. And so people who experience toxic stress, who, who experience it continuously or frequently Okay, stress is a normal process that we all experience. But what the typical person does is they experience stress or trauma and then, and then they back down and their body goes into what we call homeostasis. They go back to normal. What my thinking is with these children who are stuck in these, these high conflict, adverse relationships and getting exposed to alienation tactics, if you will, What's happening is these kids are not getting an opportunity to come back to homeostasis. They're constantly under stress, continuously. And as we know, alienation doesn't happen over a weekend. It happens over, it's a process over time. So it starts to snowball. The child gets exposed to um, a, the, the, the discord during the relationship that the marriage is in to where one parent leaves. That's a big event for children. When you, we have a parent leaving a, a residence, their whole security foundation is just pulled out from under them. No matter what the situation is, even if it was a high conflict and it was a domestic violence, domestic violence is, a, is an adverse childhood experience. So you see the child experiencing the arguing, the fighting, the domestic violence, a parent leaving, and then there's no contact with that parent. 
these are just events, milestones in a child's life that become devastating. Um, if I could, Dr. Evans, you're amazing. Uh, and we could do a, a six hour show. We're, we're gonna have to plan on some other ones in the future. We have some more time. Uh, but I wanna say it's amazing what you're saying. And it's so absolutely true. People need to go back and listen to you over and over and over again. And as Danica said, we don't like to make it about us, but I can tell you as a child who had both parents leave, the long-term effects, I, I feel fortunate that I, was, I, I came out of it and, and, and got myself better, but I can tell you, the effects it has on every single relationship in your life is unbelievable. You, I, I did not know how to function in a healthy way with anyone in my life. Uh, I didn't have security when it came to jobs. I was instantly afraid of everything and everybody leaving me. So one of the things that you said before the show and here now is a lot of people in the moment, because sometimes in that moment, people are selfish and they say things that they don't think about long-term effects that it has on children, how devastating and damaging. And you can look at the correlation with suicides, uh, doctor, and I, I know you've done that uh, when it comes to fathers or, and or mothers leaving the home. Uh, and Danica, I sent you a video a couple days ago. It speaks exactly to what the, the awesome doctor is saying when it comes to stress and anxiety. Certain amounts are good for us. That keeps us safe, keeps us uh, present, keeps us aware. But that long-term toxic stress, when you look at the correlation with physical issues, as the doctor is talking about, uh, you cannot ha harbor that sort of toxicity in your system and fear and worry constantly and not have it manifest itself in a physical way and in other ways psychologically. So, uh, doctor, <laughs> amazing. We always say, Danica, these things are meant to be. And we run into people the way they're sp we're supposed to. And this is definitely one of those cases. Yeah. Definitely. You know, um, a few years ago, I, I went to a screening for a documentary and it's called Paper Tigers. And it was a fan um, in Walla Walla, Washington. There was a high school and they decide and they did a study on these these kids, these kids, they all came from the inner city. They came from broken homes and stuff like that. And they were talking about that very thing where where they're, they're on such heightened alert and constant stress that you get your brain knows no difference between a real tiger and a paper tri tiger. It just goes right. zero to 60 instantly. There's, um, and, and that's what happens when these, these kids are going through right. alienation. Um, what happens is, in tech, I mean, I, I've got a lot of research. I could show you a pile that I got right near my desk, but the research basically shows that when the system, the human is under such stress for such continuous uh, time frames, if you will, um, the central nervous system actually changes. So what happens is, you talked about it, uh, kids who are in, in orphanages, the research on orphanages, these children actually, their brains are actually smaller. They don't develop as much as children who have not been exposed to that. There's, or, there's subcortical mechanisms in our brain that under constant fire basically start to morph and change and then actually ultimately attack our immune system. So we become more vulnerable to disease. And, and that's the causation piece to this whole thing. You could argue, you could argue whether there's such a thing as parent alienation or parent alienation syndrome. And the academicians can go on and on and on and say, well, it's all pseudoscience or whatever. But when you start to look at behavior, you look at alienating parents' behavior, you look at the rejected parents' behavior, okay? You, you look at the consequences of the child. The fix, the solution is the child needs to know that there's somebody there that cares about them and this is not their fault. And so many kids walk away from these situations thinking, I, I, I didn't eat my spinach last night. I know that's why this thing happened. I mean, it's as, as innocent as that is, or, or other types of things, but they ultimately come back to the idea that they take the blame for it for somehow or other. Um, and it, it, it goes deeper than that. It goes because what happens is, I mean, what happens is somebody will go to court and they'll say, I need protection from this other spouse because they're afraid of them or they're violent or they're angry. The knee jerk of the courts is they, in, they, they immediately put into place an injunction. So there's no contact between the, the parents at a minimum and frequently they'll convince the court that they got to protect the child. 
So now there's no contact for 60, 90. And sometimes these things go on, these temporary injunctions go on for years. What they need to do is immediately put the mother, the father, or the, the parents, whatever gender they are, put the parents and the child in some kind of a treatment center, some kind of a trauma treatment center to focus on the trauma. Because it didn't happen the day the person walked into court to get the injunction. It's been going on for a long time. Right. So the, both everybody needs help. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts, because how many of these allegations are accurate or true or valid i'll bet you dollars to donuts you'll start to see a decline if they know that they're going to have to start going to do get they have to get treatment you're going to see that going back to the Ad, uh, aces study keep in mind these are adults responding to a questionnaire about what occurred in their childhood nobody validated their responses to say yes in fact they had there was domestic violence in their home or there was you know, they, they, were, they were abused as children. Nobody validated that. They took the people's words for it. How many of those 9,300 people that responded were victims of alienation? I, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. But do you think out of the 9,300, some people believed that they were abused, that they believed that there was substance abuse going on in a home? I'll bet you they were. And then I can fast forward to my other stuff that I'm looking at in my other research in terms of whether or not it's it's valid or whether you would believe it or you imagined it and frankly there's no difference in terms of how your body's going to respond whether it be you you come to believe it as a false memory or you actually experience it it doesn't matter in fact there's some research to suggest if you come to believe it and it didn't happen the consequences might even be worse wow yeah it's unbelievable and it's it's, it's science. This isn't about, well, there's no such thing as parent alienation syndrome. Okay, look at the behavior, look at the research that we have in the medical field, the medical field, and, and some of the psychological field, but most of it's medical. Yeah, you know, people get down to the science of it and make sure those professionals who are going in to speak on your behalf in the courts, make sure they know what they're doing and they're not, you know, a, a dollar store, um, you know, person who's speaking on your behalf because um, I found that a lot of pr the professionals uh, have a diversity of um, of experience and professionalism and, it, and, and to be fair it's a specialized area that that it takes more than reading one book i, I remember a case uh, i had in the state of washington i'll never forget this and this this person did an evaluation of a parent and the one parent was trying like a dickens to convince the evaluator that there was parent alienation going on and so during the examination of the evaluator, he was asked, well, how, what, tell us about your education and experience in, in parental alienation. And his response was, drum roll, he read an article. Mm -hmm. And so he did not find parent alienation based, I guess, on the article that he read. I don't know. But it was like, you got to be kidding me. And I, it's high, the high density populations like in New York, certain large cities, you're going to get some more people who may be more knowledgeable about it. When you get into less populated areas, like I was in the state of Washington, they, this is not anything that they look at. And when you look at authors like uh, who wrote the um, um, Children Held Hostage out of the American Bar Association, that book, Claywara and Rivlin, um, they said this phenomenon of parental not parental alienation, phenom phenom elements of brainwashing and programming in 86% of the cases that they looked at. And they looked at a thousand cases. So you got a range of, of, of how frequent or what's the, what's the numbers that we're looking at. 86% of high conflict divorces to, now oh, you have estimates of 10, 15, 25. You're still looking at thousands of children a year are being exposed to this. And then that's not even, that's just looking at the psychological research. That's not even looking at the ACEs kind of phenomenon that's going on in our society. So you know, it's, 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 
I find it interesting, you know, back in the day when I was a child and, and you know, they, they tried to, to educate you on stranger danger, they were, uh, it was my impression as a child that you're looking for somebody big and scary. And so it's very subjective, you know, what you think is big and scary until people started saying, well, these are the behaviors to look for. Let's, let's talk, let's, let's speak in quantitative, scientific uh, kind of language and stuff like that to observe it. And it just seems like we still have people who are being very subjective. Same, same thing with the courts. And, um, and you wonder why people are getting it wrong and, and you're actually uh, ushering the child into being completely with the alienating parent and the, the, the targeted parent is marginalized or just completely cut out, then this child has no healthy uh, parent in their life to get to ground them for the future. And that entire side of the family frequently is, is cut out too. So it's a, a, a doesn't, what, what, what the courts look at in terms of behavior and what the evaluators look at in terms of behavior, it, it's a non-conforming kind of a, a model that they look at and they see one parent, a guardian ad litem will go do a home visit. They'll see one parent who will, appears to be well, well attached to the child, well-meaning, well-caring, and the other parent, of course, if you have the rejected parent, you're now getting, you're, now you're dragged into court X number of times, you're angry, you're frustrated, you don't know how to solve the process, you don't know how to solve the problem, you're in a system that doesn't understand what's going on and you're angry, you're frustrated. And so you behave that way. Hello. So the judge is sitting there saying, well, here's this person over here. They're all angry and they're frustrated and they're this, and you got this other person who's just calm, cool and collected and has the kid under their wing. And so it, it's sort of like, well, who's the problem parent here, obviously. And so it's, it's, it just, it doesn't, the, the picture that they see, doesn't match what's really going on. And, Absolutely. and that's where the education needs to happen to, to look at things. So speaking of education, you are going to be one of our um, speakers and presenters along with Dr. Michael Bone at our April event, Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference. Uh, this conference is designed for professionals who are impacted by parental alienation. For instance, school professionals, legal professionals, mediators, uh, mental health counselors. Um, but obviously, parents are welcome and encouraged to come. So right. would you just give us, a, we only have like a couple of minutes, but just share with us a little bit about what you're gonna be bringing to our conference in April. Oh, um, are we talking about what, evaluations? You, um, according, you are gonna be, um, I think Dr. Bone told me that you're gonna be speaking of the damaging effects of parental alienation on the child and the research, much of what we've all, we've sure. been in this conversation with. Right. Well, I mean, basically, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about what parental alienation is briefly because I'm pro I'm preaching to the choir. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what um, uh, what the literature talks about in terms of the ACEs study, and the ACEs study is now going all over the world, so it's it's quite a phenomenon. And then from the ACEs study, where you're talking about correlations, we're going to go into causal. In other words, what is specifically going on in terms of the changes in the system, the human body, the brain, in terms of how it's causing these kind of problems. And then we're going to talk about the research that tells us about whether you've actually experienced it or uh, what you've come to believe you've experienced. And that's where the fascinating piece is, because a lot of, I can hear what the distractors are going to say, well, there's, you know, you can't, if a child just thinks that happened, well, it doesn't really matter, right? The child's just misinformed or you know, it's no, there aren't any consequences. Not so. There's a very robust literature um, in terms of the medical community that talks about how suggestible humans are. And that's another argument, too. There's a whole, there's a whole group out there saying, oh, children aren't really suggestible, you know. They, 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 have the, they, you know they, know, they know what they want. They know what they need. They have their minds made up. So when they reject a parent, that's probably okay. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know what school you go to in terms of right. human development, but it's not okay. It's abnormal. So okay, bud, guess what time it is. <laughs> time to go again. I, I want to, first of all, again, thank 
Dr. Evans for coming on. I, I'm looking forward to meeting you down in Florida, sir. I know we're, I, I'm looking forward to future conversations. Uh, thank you, as always, to Danica Joan, Custody Matters Live, this week and every week. I want to say something real quick, Danica. To the folks out there suffering through this, uh, you see a lot of things out there um, in reference to parental alienation. And I know a lot of people that are battling against it as parents right now suffer from it as children. So some of us never had those heroes that came into our lives, right? But you can be your child's hero. Break those cycles of dysfunction. Be the hero that you always should have for your parent, for your child. Instead of making excuses, break that, break that cycle. Give your child love and that security that they, that they need, that they should have. Um, and again, I want to thank Danica and Dr. Evans and to everybody out there. Custody Matters Live this week and every week, 730 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Chins up. Thank you. All right. See you next week on Custody Matters Live.